return of the king on Wednesday of next week. That's it. By accidentally having the class on the syllabus on Monday, boy, I just really screwed up. Um, so we're picking up with chapter two, Shout of the Past. Yeah, at least. Um, yeah, at least. <clears throat> so we left off with Gandalf telling Frodo on page 46. Um, talking about the ring. Bottom of the page. It's far more powerful than I ever dared to think at first. So powerful that in the end, it would utterly overcome anyone of mortal race who possessed it. It would possess him. And then he goes on and he tells a little bit about the rings being made. Um, there were great rings, there were lesser rings, and rings of power. And he says, rings of power, top of page 47, were perilous. A mortal Frodo, who keeps one of the great rings, does not die, he does not grow or obtain more life. He merely continues until at last every minute is a weariness. And if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes in the end invisible permanently and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power that rules the rings. Sooner or later, if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, but neither strength nor good purpose will last, sooner or later the dark power will devour him. Frodo, how terrifying. Okay, So Gandalf has now told Frodo, sooner or later, no matter what, a mortal who tries to own, use, possess one of the great rings will be possessed, owned, used by that ring, okay? So Frodo says, how long have you known this? And how much did Bilbo know? And so Gandalf goes on and says some stuff, says Bilbo didn't know anything more than really what he told you, okay? And Bilbo warned Frodo about using it. So Frodo's kept, you know, he's kept it close. He hasn't used it much, et cetera, et cetera. So he asks again, how long have you known all this? Gandalf, bottom of page 47. Known? I've known much that only the wise know Frodo. And when he says that, he's kind of slapping Frodo down. Like, who do you think you are asking me how much I know? Okay? But if you mean known about this ring, uh, you know, I don't know, really. He doesn't have conclusive proof. There's one last test to make. When did I first begin to guess? Uh, when Bilbo first got ownership of the ring. That's when. And he goes on and he talks about, you know, what Bilbo said at the time and such. And go on to page 49, talking about, he's talked about, you know, um, Bilbo having had the ring, how he felt better once he gave the ring up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And page 49, he says, you know, of course, it would be horrible if the dark power overcame the Shire. If all your kind, jolly, stupid, bulgers, hornblowers, etc., etc., became enslaved. Frodo, but why? Why should we be enslaved? What have we done against the dark power, Sauron? Okay, Gandalf. Well, to be honest with you, Frodo, he goes on, he says, I don't think he ever thought about you before. You're insignificant. You're nothing to him. He says, but hobbits as miserable slaves would please him far more than hobbits happy and free. There is such a thing as malice and revenge. Now, malice is what? Hate. Hate. Okay. Pure hate. How is revenge different than malice? Revenge, you might have a reason for it. Okay. It, it's uh, taken in response to another action. Okay. But it's also Calculate. an act of hate. Revenge is. Okay. So, revenge for what? What have, I, what have we done to Sauron? It's not like we ran into his backyard and, you know, pulled his flowers or kicked his dog or something like that. What have we done? I don't, I still don't understand. What does all this have to do with Bilbo, myself, and our ring? So he says, everything. I wasn't sure when I was last year, but now has come to time to speak. Give me the ring for a moment. <coughs> the for a moment is really important. Because if Gandalf were to say, give me the ring, 
that can be taken as what? A command. Okay? So, Frodo pulls it out of his pocket. He kind of hands it to Gandalf. Gandalf holds it, says, you see any markings on it? He says, nope, there are none. It's quite plain. Well, look, and he throws it into Bilbo's, excuse me, into Frodo's fireplace. And Frodo squeals. Okay. Gandalf says, hold on. And then he reaches into the fire with the tongs and he pulls the ring out. Even if the ring has only been in there a few seconds, what happens to metal when you put it on a fire that has glowing red embers? It heats up very quickly. And he pulls it out with the tongs. Notice Gandalf doesn't pull it out with the tongs and drop it in his, hand, in his own hand first. He says, here, Frodo, put your hand out. And Frodo does. It's quite cool. Take it, Gandalf says. Telling us, ain't your average ordinary metal. This, this isn't just regular old gold. And now Frodo sees writing on it. He says, I see the letters, but I can't read them. Gandalf says, they're elvish. And he reads them in what's called the common tongue, the language they speak. It's not the language they are written in. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. And he says, two verses of a much longer um, Two lines of a much longer verse. And he then recites the much longer verse. Three rings for the elven kings are under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords. You can read it, you know, on your own. One ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. This is it. This is the one ring. This is the ring Sauron lost, he says, many ages ago. To the great weakening of his power, he greatly desires it, but he must not end. Okay. Allegory, applicability, you know, Tolkien talks about in the forward. Applicability is the reading something and being able to apply it to real life. Seeing kind of real life lessons, if you want. What students today like to call relatability. The proper word is relevant. It's not relatability. What's the relevance or relatability? If this is the most powerful thing that Sauron has, what is its equivalent in our world? Nuclear arms. An atomic bomb. Not just any old atomic bomb, but at any particular point, the greatest, most powerful atomic bomb. Okay? Or hydrogen bomb, which is even more powerful than an atomic bomb. Okay? So, the ring, Frodo says, how on earth did it come to me? That is, who am I to have Satan's sword, you know, essentially? Gandalf, what? Now, that's a really long story. We got to go, got to go way back for that. He said, I told you last night about Sauron the Great, the Dark Lord. Rumors you've heard, they're true. Always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. Well, what was the defeat and the respite? Towards the end of The Hobbit, Gandalf leaves Bilbo and the dwarves to go do something else. That something else is he and the other members of the White Council kick the necromancer out of a place called Dol Guldur. The other members of the White Council, Galadriel, Er, uh, not Aragorn, uh, Elrond, and Saruman. The necromancer, Sauron. Okay. He had a defeat there. How long ago was that? About 67 years. And so now, things are moving on again, and he has grown back to power. Notice what Tolkien is saying here. Always after a defeat, the shadow takes another shape. What's the shadow? It's not Sauron. It's not Sauron's boss. In Tolkien's cosmology, a guy named, a being named Melkor or Morgoth. It's what? It's evil. Just 
unnamed evil. Always after a loss, evil <coughs> does what? It takes another shape. It takes another form. Tolkien served in the war to end all wars. And less than a generation after the war to end all wars, we had what? Another war. World War II. See, when World War II came around, then the earlier war to end all wars started getting called um, World War I. And now what do we still hear about once a year or so in the press? Will there be a World War III? Okay. So, Frodo, I wish it need not have happened in my time. You know, you know what, Sherlock? What do you think was one of the things that went through George Bush's mind when he sat there reading My Pet Goat or whatever the book was to kindergartners on September 11th, 2001, around 9.30 in the morning, when Andy Carr, his chief of staff, comes up and goes, I kind of imagine one of the first things that went in his mind was, why did this happen under Clinton? Why me? He got elected president. Right? You can go into the politics if you want. But he did not run on a campaign of what? Foreign policy. He'd been governor of Texas for two terms. He didn't know squat about foreign policy. He ran on a program, a policy you want, of domestic stuff. And he was immediately, within nine months, thrown into foreign policy big time. And then the whole rest of his tenure... Pretty much all foreign policy, except for the stuff, you know, he got conned into doing, you know, in terms of domestic policy. No child left behind and that kind of stuff. Gandalf. Yeah, so do I, Frodo. So did George Bush, Frodo. And so do all who live to see such times. Do you really think FDR woke up on December 8th, 1941 and said, hot damn, I'm glad I'm president. What a great time to be an American. When Pearl Harbor is burning? Probably not. But, Gandalf says, that's not for them to decide. Right? How many of us got to decide when we were born? No. <laughs> or what family we were born into? No. What do we get to decide? What we're going to do with the hand that's been dealt, with the cards that we've been given. So, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that it's given us. He says, and Frodo, that time does not look good. This is the element of this catastrophe. And you got to admit, Frodo's got it pretty bad <laughs> compared to any of us. Because you're not walking around with Satan's ring hanging from a chain around your neck or in your pocket, and he really, really wants it bad. Because that, I mean, Sauron is pretty much the equivalent of Satan. Okay? So, we have to decide what are we going to do with the time that is given us. What does Tolkien mean? We have to confront what? Creative fantasy is founded upon hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. We have to use our time to do what? Face that hard recognition. Upon a recognition of fact, the end of the quote, but not a slavery to it. Does the fact that Frodo has Satan's ring mean Frodo just has to roll over and go, kill me now? Nope. He can do what? Fight. He can fight. Is he going to win? He's a midget. <laughs> Against an all power, seemingly all powerful being. By the way, if you're not aware, Sauron is essentially what we would kind of call a god. He is a godlike creature. Or, let's use Tolkien's Catholic co cosmology. He is a fallen angel. Within Tolkien's created Middle Earth cosmology, he is a fallen angelic being. Right? There are other, quote-unquote, 
angelic beings, not mortal, within the Lord of the Rings. We'll talk about them when we get to the end of the story, because I don't want to give anything away. So, he says, Sauron still lacks something before he can get total control, Frodo. He needs one thing. Yeah, it's your ring. Can't let him get it. So he goes on and he talks about all these other rings. He talks about the three rings that the elf lords have. Have, notice, not had. They still have them. They're still hidden. Sauron doesn't know who has them. He talks about the nine rings given to mortal men. He knows exactly where all those are. Why? Because those nine, the wielders of those nine rings are now his servants. Those are what are called the Nazgul. <coughs> And I know some people say, no, no, no. The Nazgul are actually the things that the Black Riders fly on, like dragons. There's some discrepancy. There's some confusion as to that. Okay? They're the nine, the Black Riders. All right? What else? Well, there were seven given to the dwarves. Some of those Sauron has. Some of them have been destroyed. All right? And, and then there's the one. And he knows the one has been discovered. And he gives us a big, long story. And he tells the story of Gollum. And Frodo's like page 54. Gollum? Wait, whoa. You mean the same Gollum that Bilbo met? Nearly 70 years ago? Yep. How loathsome. Gandalf, I think it is a sad story. And it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits I have known. In other words, don't get so full of yourself, Sonny. You, too, can become a golem. I can't believe that golem was connected with hobbits, however distantly. Why not? Why can't Frodo believe that golem is a distant relation of hobbits? Because he seems like a disgusting creature. Keep going. And... We hobbits are nice. We're good people. He he couldn't be like us. Because what does that mean? If he could be like us, you could be like then him. we could be like him. So, let's jump to the real world. What do we often do with our quote-unquote national enemies? Louder? We dehumanize them. We turn... The Japanese to Japs or Nips. We turn the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, to Gooks. I mean, at least Japs is just an abbreviation for Japanese. Gook? Okay, that's completely other. We turn the Germans into Jerry's or Krauts. Okay? Italians become Spicks. Those we don't even like, let's take war out of the picture. Those we don't like from other groups become chinks, dagos, wops. Pick your racial epithet. Why? Because it makes them less than human. And if it makes them less than human, then I can hate them freely. I could go to bed and pray to Jesus and still feel all this wonderful hatred because they're not like Jesus, so to speak. That's why Frodo cannot accept that Gollum was a hobbit. Think of Hitler for a moment. What does everybody, and you still hear this, you still read about this, what does everybody say about Hitler? How did Hitler become Hitler? Well, he was obviously sick. You know, syphilis. That's, that's what it was. He had syphilis, and the syphilis <laughs> rotted his brain. Rather than accept what other possibility? He's just a bad one. He just chose to be that way. <coughs> or Stalin. Joseph Stalin. He, by the way, responsible for a hell of a lot more dead people than Hitler was. 60 to 100 million Russians died because of Stalin. Stalin studied for the priesthood. Does that mean all priests are going to, you know, leave the whole problem with the Catholic Church and Sexual problems all up for, aside for a moment. 
this was if he studied for the priesthood, he knew something or believed something about God. Did God tell him to kill those? Hmm. So what again, what do we do? We say, oh, there must be have been something wrong. Rather than, no, they had an objective and they went about to attain that objective. Okay. So Gandalf says, well, whatever you believe, Frodo, it's true. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Whether you think he's related to hobbits, it's true. How do we know? He knew the exact same riddles. The exact same riddles that Bilbo knew. Oh, and by the way, when Bilbo meets Gollum, Gollum's over 500 years old. Because of the ring. Right? So, they keep talking. And Bilbo, uh, Gandalf says, you know, and this is the most curious part of the whole tale. How the ring just happened to be found by Bilbo. What? Just in time to meet Bilbo? Frodo jokes. Wouldn't an orc have suited it better? I mean, if the ring is evil, then wouldn't an evil being have... Because it's not funny, Frodo. There was more than one power at work. The ring was trying to get back to its master. What does that imply about the ring? It's sentient. It's sentient. It has volition. It doesn't have legs. <laughs> doesn't have wings. It can't, you know, fly back. It had slipped from Isildur's hand, and Isildur is a warrior, etc., etc., Fell off in the river. It got found by Diagol. Smeagol kills Diagol, takes it, and then it falls off Smeagol's hand 500 years later, just in time for Bilbo, who knocks his head on an overhanging rock to fall off and wake up in the dark and find it. Behind that, page 56. Behind that, there was something else at work beyond any design of the ringmaker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring. Okay, so if Bilbo was meant to find the ring, what does that word meant automatically imply? Fate. Fate? Or a, like a predetermined destiny. Okay. Does fate intend things? Fate is usually described as an impersonal force. Fate is not a god. In the Greek system, you've got the gods over here, you've got fate over here. The gods can tell us, humans, what fate has in store, but the gods can't change fate. And fate doesn't control the gods. Okay? Tolkien says he was meant to have it. Meant is a verb. It means somebody meaned for Frodo or Bilbo to have the ring. In which case, you also were meant to have it, and that should be encouraging. Uh, sorry, I've got Satan's ring. That's not encouraging. So somebody wanted me. Who's the somebody? Who's the mean or that wanted Bilbo to have the ring? It's never explicitly stated. Not at all. In fact, the character from other Tolkien stories is never named in the Lord of the Rings, but it's Iru Iluvatar, the one God who creates everything. Okay? We're going to find out in the course of the novel that there are people who serve this being. Okay? So, Frodo, no, no, it's not encouraging. And I still don't understand. How much of this do you really know? Or are you just guessing? And he's kind of like, who the, man, I'm not guessing. I'm not going to give an account of all my doings to you. He says, the fire riding alone tells us it's the one ring. Okay? So, Gandalf says, here's how I know. I caught Gollum. I talked to him. He didn't freely give up what he knew. Gandalf says, I had to put the threat of fire on him. I used to edit a journal, a journal devoted to the works of J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, and other writers like them. And I had a guy shortly after 9-11, I think it was 2003, 2004, a lawyer in Washington, D.C., submitted an article. And the article was essentially about this passage. 
And it was kind of, you know, the title of it was something like um, Frodo and the Ticking Time Bomb. And it was it dealt with an ethical question. What do you do if you catch a terrorist and you believe the terrorist knows the location of a ticking time bomb and the location and the terrorist won't give up to you the location? Is it ever ethically, morally justified to rip that guy's fingernails out <laughs> or to torture him in any other way? Well, about the same time, what was one of the, in fact, I think it might have been the number one TV series. It was on Fox. It's called 24. It starred Kiefer Sutherland as Jack Bauer. And Jack Bauer always got his bag die. Why? Because he did whatever it took. He even took wire cutters and snipped off guys' fingers to get them to talk. Okay? So this whole article, we didn't publish it. The whole article was about, you know, is it, Gandalf doesn't say he tortured. He said, I put the threat of fire. So maybe that's like the blowtorch up close to the head, but not actually doing it. Anyways, Gollum squealed. And then Gandalf tells us, page 59, when he finally, when Frodo finally understands the gravity of the situation, Sauron now knows the ring has been discovered. It's not been lost. It's not been destroyed. Not only has it been discovered, it is in the Shire. And not only is it in the Shire, a little blank hellhole that he's never heard of before, but it's in the possession of somebody named Baggins. So all I have to do is, you know, get on Google and look for Baggins in the Shire. And... Frodo, this is terrible. Middle of 59. Far worse than the worst that I imagine from your hints and warnings. Oh, Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. Like, yeah, now you get it. What a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. What's the vile creature? Gollum. When did Bilbo have the chance to stab Gollum? When they first met. About 70 years previous. Okay. And if you've read The Hobbit... You'll know, the thought does go through Bilbo's mind. I should kill him. Why? He intends to kill me. He intends to kill me. I should kill him. After 9-11, the Bush administration came up with the doctrine of preemptive war. Preemptive. Strike your possible enemy before the possible enemy becomes your real enemy. Kind of like if you're familiar with um, the film version of the Philip K. Dick novel, Minority Report. Arrest people before they can do the crime, because you know they intend to. <laughs> so just stop them. Okay? What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had the chance. Pity, Gandalf says, it was pity that stayed his hand. They're using pity in two different ways, aren't they? Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. See, Bilbo escaped from Gollum, and he did it without harming him. He didn't have to kill him. He could have killed him just to make sure, but he didn't have to. So Gandalf says it was pity and mercy that kept Bilbo from killing him. What's the difference between pity and mercy? With pity, there's a sense of looking down on something, but with mercy, there's a sense of like um, uh, quality. Yeah, quality. Okay. Use the example we used the other day, talking about you know hunger and stuff. You're driving down Old Fort Parkway. You're getting onto 24. You're getting off 24 onto Old Fort. And you see somebody holding a sign, hungry, homeless, haven't eaten in days. Can you help? What immediately goes through your mind? Sucks to be that guy. Pity. Sucks to be that guy. Okay. That's the feeling of, man, that's horrible. What a rotten life. Okay. That's pity. What's mercy? 
taking action is mer to make it better. Mercy is taking action, but it's not only taking action. Mercy also implies that another person is under, to some degree or extent, or extent your power. That is, you have an ability to do something to them. We usually talk about mercy in what context? We don't talk about it in stopping and giving food to the homeless. War. Is it war? Um, like uh, killing someone and fighting against it, or al almost, rather. Almost. Okay. Justice. We use mercy, we tend to use mercy more when an idea of justice is involved. Be merciful. What can a judge do you know, in a sentencing hearing? Book to them or they can leave. The judge can lock them up for, you know, first offense drugs. You can get sent to prison for a first offense. Or probation. you can get probation, you can get a slap on the wrist, you can get community service. That is, the judge has wide le leniency. Mercy is not lock them up. Mercy is, okay, I'm going to give you this one chance. Don't do it again. Why? Because that person is totally within the judge's power. Okay? Gollum was totally within Bilbo's power. What could Bilbo have done? But he didn't. He acted mercifully. He kind of, I'm going to give him the second chance. Okay? He also said, Yeah, he did. Be sure, Gollum, uh, Gandalf goes on, be sure that he took so little hurt from the evil. What's the evil that Bilbo took so little hurt from? It's the ring. And escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring. So, with pity. He felt for Gollum. He looked at Gollum and sees he is a shriveled, shrunken husk of what he once was and feels pity towards him. I'm sorry. I'm frightened, and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. Notice, why doesn't he feel any pity? He hasn't met him yet, but he told us. He's scared. He is scared. How scared is he? Satan's coming for me. That's pretty scared. You've all seen horror films about you know, demonic possession, but it's real. And he's coming for me. Yeah, he's scared. Okay? And because he's scared, what do people often do if they're really, really scared? And they have a means to act. Lash out. You know, I'm just gonna take them all out, you know. I'll ask questions later. Yeah. Gandalf, you haven't seen him. If you seen him, you would feel pity. No, and I don't want to. Why doesn't he want to? It's a lot easier to hate <laughs> and fear than it is to the opposite of hate, love, and to hope. I can't... Uh, stop. Time out here, Gandalf. You mean to tell me you and the elves, you let him live on? Because remember, they captured Gollum. They put him in prison. The elves did. After all those horrible deeds? After all what horrible deeds? What horrible deeds did Gandalf actually recount that Gollum had done? There's only one that's actually really, truly horrible. He killed his best friend. Okay. For his quote-unquote birthday present. And he, you know, then used to put it on and go thieving. That's pretty bad. And maybe... Uh, like, you know, capturing things and eating them. We know he did that. But what's the really horrible stuff for, for Frodo? He just told the, the location. He told Satan where I live. That's the really horrible part. Now, at any rate, he is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. Just an enemy means what? Not human. He's not human because he's gone. And, okay. But yeah. Just an enemy means, if something is just an enemy, what can you do to it? 
easily pull the trigger. Easily pull the trigger. You can kill it and go right to sleep without any qualm, without any conscience. Right? He deserves death. That's why we have enemies. Enemies are to be killed. Period. That's their sole reason for existing as an enemy. Is so that I have target practice. Okay? Gandalf. Deserves it? I dare say he does. You're right, Fredo. He does deserve death. I, I, I think I agree with you. Many that live deserve death. What do you mean? There's a lot of people sucking air and taking up space on this green earth. They shouldn't be sucking air and taking up space. Oh, I don't know. Child rapists. Child murderers. Any rapists. <laughs> Any murderers. I think most people would say, yeah. They're using valuable oxygen. But Gandalf doesn't stop there. And some that die deserve life. Like five-year-olds who get cancer and die. Or people who get in car wrecks and die. Or students in classrooms that other students who are whack jobs come in and kill. Okay. Do they deserve to live? Yes, they do. Can we bring them back? No, we can't. As we will hear in one of the Harry Potter novels, alas, there is no spell that can bring back the dead. Can you give it to them? Frodo, can you give life back to those who have died and didn't deserve to die? Notice, it's a rhetorical question. then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. Because Frodo has done what? Kind of metaphorically for Gollum. He's held the trial. He's held the trial. He's been the prosecutor. He's been the judge. And he's willing to pull the trigger. He's judged Gollum already and said, not worth living. How does Gandalf turn that on its head? Okay. Deserves death? Yes, he does. And some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Obviously not. Then don't be too eager to deal out death in judgment. Why? Because you can't see the end goal. Bingo. Perfect answer. You passed the class. <laughs> what does Gandalf mean by that? Is Gollum the bad stuff he has done? No. Because what can happen? He can change. He can change. But let's not use the word change, because that's a word that's bandied about and doesn't mean squat. Let's use the word Gandalf uses. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. Ends there doesn't mean only what we think of as ends, like um, finality or finish line. It also means purpose or purposes. Okay? We can't see how Gollum's life will end, and we can't see Gollum's real ultimate Purpose. Now, why do I bring up this idea of purpose? What did Gandalf just tell Frodo fairly recently about Frodo's ownership of the ring? He was meant to have you it. were meant to have it. That's purpose. No one could have predicted it. Exactly. I have not much hope that Gollum can be not changed. Cured. Cured. Thank you for saying save, though, because I'm going to bring that in. Cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. Okay, first of all, why should he care? Why does he care whether or not Gollum is cured before he dies? 
I'm still going to die. Okay. So what does he mean by cure? Bring personal peace. Say for Gollum, he could have peace before he died. Okay, personal peace. Usually when you need a cure, what does that say about you? You have an illness. You have an illness. Okay. And this may be where, where some of Tolkien's Catholicism comes into play. Tolkien says in one of his letters that the Lord of the Rings um, is fundamentally a Catholic and philosophical work, a religious and philosophical work, I think are the words he uses. Not in the creation, but in the revising. Right? And what he means by that is, as he revised it, he couldn't keep some of those ideas, some of those beliefs that he had, from filtering in. So what does he mean, Catholic or religious and philosophical work? Does Jesus ever mention the Lord of the Rings? No, he's not. Does God ever mention it? No, he's not. He is mentioned in Harry Potter, though. Yeah. Jesus isn't. God is. Does Mary ever mention I mean, we're talking Catholic. Does Mary ever mention Not as such, Mary might be alluded to with another character's name, which we'll talk about. Any of the apostles, any quote-unquote Christian doctrine, does anybody die on a cross to save other people? Nope. Okay. In fact, the Lord of the Rings is, within its cosmology, within its world, pagan. Because what happens when you die? That's it. Don't go off and be with the, you know, whatever. Okay? So, he hopes that Gollum can be cured. Why? Because Gollum is obviously ill. The early church, which Tolkien was very well versed in, up until, oh, early Middle Ages, thought of sin not as a legal problem. Not as, oh, you broke the law. Therefore, a big angry God is going to judge you and send you to hell. Unless nice meek Jesus comes and, you know, stands in your place and takes you to heaven. Uh-uh. It saw sin as illness. So if you're sick, what do you need? You need a doctor. You need a place to go to be cured of your sickness. That's what the church kind of was thought of. So Gandalf says, I don't have much hope that he can be cured. Let's say possibly healed of this. But notice, not much is not none. Okay. Now, you said the word saved. What do you do when you cure meat? You're not healing it. You're saving it. You are preserving it for later use. Either sense, senses of the meaning cure apply. What does Gandalf hope will happen to Gollum before he takes his last breath? He will be restored to his right self. Now, if you've seen the films, or if you've read the novel, what do we obviously know about Gollum? What's his real name? Smeagol. So why is he called Gollum? Because of noise. Because he goes Gollum. So why is he called Gollum? It's like calling somebody sneeze. Or cough. Or gag. It's not nice. Because Gollum kind of has his own personality. It's almost like this being has multiple personality disorder. And it's not almost like because we will see later, Gollum speaks to Smeagol. And Smeagol speaks back to Gollum. In the same, and they're having a debate, right? Gandalf hopes Gollum can be cured. Why? Well, towards the end of the second book, we will find out. Because Gandalf is a steward. Doesn't mean like a steward, like an airline steward, you know, going to bring you your dreams. It means Gandalf 
kind of serves in a position of power for an absent ruler. Who that absent ruler is, we can debate. Okay? But he doesn't just stop there. His, his hope isn't only that Gollum is cured. He takes that then one more step. And my heart tells me he has some part to play yet for good or ill before the end. And when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. In other words, my gut reaction is he's got something to do with the ring that's going to come up later. Okay? Does that put Frodo at ease? He's like, oh, well, that's cool then. All right, I'm, I'm, everything's fine, you know. No. So, they continue talking. Bilbo, excuse me, Frodo, offers the ring. Let me back up. Page 61. I know, we are, I mean, we're so far behind. Page 61. Bilbo, uh, Frodo suggests, well, why don't we destroy the ring? And Gandalf's like, hello, have you been talking? Uh, have you been listening? You can't just destroy it. You want to really destroy the ring? Here's what you have to do. Find the cracks of doom in the depths of Oradru and the Fire Mountain. Cast the ring in, where, in there if you really wish to destroy it. To put it beyond the grasp of the enemy forever. March down to the ninth circle of Dante's hell. And find Satan's fireplace. And put it in there. Then it will be destroyed. Frodo, I do really wish to destroy it. Notice the verb tense and what is called the voice in that sentence. I, subject, do really wish to destroy it. Active verb, active voice. I want to destroy it. I want to be the one doing the destroying. And then what does he realize? Well, maybe not him. Well, that ain't, well, well back up there. Not me personally. I don't want to be the one to go take out Bin Laden. I really do want Bin Laden dead. But, no, no, that's why we hire SEAL Team 6. I mean, we want them to go and do that. Why? Because that's not my line of work. Or, or, well, to have it destroyed. He moves from active voice, active present tense, to passive voice. I want somebody over there to go do it. I'm not made for perilous quests. I wish I'd never seen the ring. Why did it come to me, Gandalf? Why was I chosen? What is why was I chosen really me? Two word phrase when bring the language shit happens. Why me? That's the other thought I think that went through George Bush's mind when Andy Card said, we're under attack. <laughs> People often have that same experience, that why me? Not only when bad things happen, but when a tornado comes through town and their house is left standing. Survivor guilt. Why was I left? Okay. Gandalf, ever the wise teacher. Such questions can't be answered. Next. What do you mean, why you? I don't know. You may be sure it was not for any merit that others do not possess. That is, Frodo, the ring didn't come to you because of power or wisdom, uh, for power or wisdom at any rate. It didn't come to you because you're oh so wise. It didn't come to you because you're Arnold Schwarzenegger shrunk down in miniature. So he says, but you've been chosen, and therefore you have to do what? You have to use such strength and wits, strength and heart and wits as you have. That is, you weren't chosen for wisdom or power, but you were chosen, so you got to use what you've been given. Whatever strength you have, whatever wits you have, intellect, and whatever heart you have. What is heart? Courage. courage. It's where the word courage comes from. Cour comes from French cour. Okay? Related to the card, as in cardiac. But I don't have any of those things, Frodo says. I have so little of any of these things. I'm not strong. I don't go to Gold's Gym. I have no wits, which is pretty clear. 
And I'm a coward. <laughs> Will you not take the ring, Gandalf? Now that's a classy move on Frodo's part. What has he just done? He's turned those tables entirely. You're obviously powerful. You're a wizard. You're obviously smart. You got wits. You're obviously courageous. I mean, you defeated him once before. Why don't you take the ring? And Gandalf, like, jumps away. No. Why not? A lot quicker than Frodo. Okay. Possible. It's far too tempting. Why? Uh, because he has many dangers ahead, and he would need to use it. Okay. He's already found his way. He wouldn't give himself any more to someone. Even though he stopped him from getting any more to him. Entirely right. He already has great power. And as we all know, because Uncle Ben tells it to Spider-Man, with great power great comes power. great responsibility. Gandalf has great power, and what does he say? It'll give me even more. And I've got so many things I need to do. He says, oh, Frodo, oh, I want it so badly. Why? Because with the ring, he could do what he wants to do. What's the problem? That's how a pirate was started. Okay. What else? He mentioned something of the of becoming a dark lord himself. He'll become a dark lord himself, even though he might be doing good for in his eyes, it'd be cruel in other people. But if the ends don't justify are good, using the ring towards good ends. What was the phrase you just said? Do the ends justify? The Do means? the ends justify the means? I want to stop crime. So I'm going to arrest everybody. What about the Thanos snap? Pardon? The Thanos it's snap. like the Thanos snap, yeah. Okay. The means or the, the uses, the, the, the things you do to get your desired goal. So the desired goal is to, oh, I'm going to use a real loaded example. Then I can run. Um, real loaded example. You want to end, quote unquote, um, oh, where should I go here? Undesirable people. However, you define undesirable people. So, what was created to end, to stop undesirable people? Eugenics, right? What's eugenics mean? We've seen this. Good genes. Who was one of the leading proponents of the eugenics movement in the early 20th century? Hitler, well, not early, mid 20th century. Margaret K. Sanger. Anybody knows who Margaret K. Sanger is? Founded Planned Parenthood. Who were the good genes? She wanted to emphasize, or who were the, let's call it, dysgenics. Dysgenics were the black population of the world to the She was a white supremacist. She wanted to get rid of blacks. Woodrow Wilson was, by the way, was also, by the way. Woodrow Wilson, under the president, before Woodrow Wilson, the government had, quote, unquote, been integrated. Okay. Blacks achieving positions of power within the government. Wilson came in, and you know what happened? He fired every last one. All right, All right we'll stop there. We'll pick up with, um, we'll pick up with where? Towards the end of the chapter, the shadow of the past, and then we're going to skip a whole bunch. I mean, we're just going to zip right through a bunch, and we'll get into the second half of Fellowship of the Ring on Wednesday. Remember, there's no class on Monday. And it looks like we could possibly have some weather issues um, next week also.